she's been one of my heroes, and she's had a lot of impact in the way that this organization and this conference is being run. Right? Um, she's served as the president of Enseca. She's a member of the International Academy of Ceramics. She's a Fulbright scholar. She used to be the director, the is it the chair or the director of Kansas, Kansas State University? Uh, I was head and then, yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then she was a director of the School of Art at Florida, University of Florida. And she is now on faculty there. Right, and getting to play more. Yeah, and, uh, and her accolades go on and Never on know. and on and on. And uh, right, I met on a, I think on the board. I think it the, was. Yeah, board stuff. And, yeah. and I do, do encourage all of you guys to get really involved. And like, um, my, my introduction to the board and running for the board from the floor was that I felt there was a real lack of diversity in our organization. And I beat a board nominee and, and that kind of led to some really interesting things. And, and got to meet great people like Anna and along the way. And so we actually crossed paths a lot mm -hmm. because she has interest in China and we spent a lot of time in Jingdegan. Mm -hmm. And so, and she's actually sent us some really amazing students. So, and uh, before, and then further ado, I'm gonna let her talk because this is her time. So. <laughs> Thank so, you so much. Yeah. And it is a pleasure to be here with you today and in this wonderful space. Uh, with almost daily developments in 3D scanning and printing, the ceramic artists can feel a bit overwhelmed and even threatened. The popular theory of craft requiring the touch of the hand is incongruous with the reality of using computer software and a machine to produce an object. Yet artists have the ability to use this technology, which has recently become much more economical and realistically accessible. It can be used to design, model, and prototype, and now even create ceramic objects. So I'll present my personal process of scanning and printing clay models for mold making and slip casting, um, used in assemblage, assemblage fashion, and also talk uh, uh, quite a bit about collaboration and how I've been able to collaborate with various people and entities, and uh, also about pedagogy and, and how you incorporate this in the classroom, because that's something I think both Soji and I are, uh, feel really, really strongly about. Um, so my um, journey, beginning of my journey, was um, um, culminated, uh, well, it didn't, it didn't culminate, it kind of started with this uh, research that I did and then a published article in the 2011 uh, International Journal Ceramics Technical, and I co-wrote that with Daniel Tankersley, who was at the time an MFA graduate student at the University of Florida. And I've had, uh, I've actually relied on a two-way collaboration with an art and technology uh, artist like Daniel, um, moved along as they graduate to different ones. Now I'll tell you a little bit more about my mo most recent work soon. Um, to create this work. And what's exciting about this is I found that the technical side is often challenged by my creative ideas and vice versa. So working together, we really kind of build, um, build on, on what we know. Um, so about seven years ago, I initiated the process that eventually led to a grant from the University of Florida Office of Research to set up and equip a 3D fabrication lab in collaboration. This was a collaboration grant. We had to collaborate with another department. Uh, so it was between the School of Art and Art History and the College of Fine Arts and the um, Department of Architecture at the College of Design, Construction, and Planning. So it was a, a joint, joint venture, basically. Um, and the facility's original equipment included um, a bunch, couple of laser cutters, a handheld 3D scanner, a Z-Core scanner, and two 3D um, uh, printers, um, that one an object and one a Z-Core, and then a CNC router. That's how we started out. Since then, there's been an expansion. Uh, it includes a lot more desktop printers, a much larger laser cutter, and recently a grant brought a water jet cutter to, into the mix, which is really amazing um, to be able to cut ceramics with. And there was a time when I thought that the disciplines of ceramics and digital technology belonged in two very different worlds. Um, and little did I know when I initiated this, it was for students. I was the director at the time. I just thought this was something our students should have. They should know how to do this if they're going to move, move forward in the future. Um, but then it, it eventually ended up having much impact on my work as well. And in um, the summer of 2010, I had a, a generous faculty enhancement grant from the University of Florida to study European porcelain. Um, I was able to return as a resident to the International Ceramic Studio in Keshkemet, Hungary, um, with a group of invited artists. <clears throat> On this trip, I'd have only two weeks. 
And uh, previously, I'd been there for four weeks. And when I was there for four weeks, I hand modeled, I hand formed my models to make uh, uh, molds and then slip casts from. And of course, that was slow and tedious. Uh, knowing that I had that short period of time, I thought I should go prepared and have models ready so that I can immediately make plaster molds and immediately slip cast with the most wonderful porcelain in the world. <laughs> next to Jing Dejen or close to Jing Dejen at Kesh Kemet. So, um, so that's when I decided I would try to use, um, use these technologies to prepare my models ahead. And I, I just brought them with me, packed them in the suitcase and took them with me. <clears throat> now this image shows a kind of computer screenshot of some of the models, uh, a completed porcelain piece and uh, one of the um, models that I was using printed at the, with the object printer and it, it uses UV light and it's a, totally a resin based printing. So it's plastic basically, but it, 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 uh, uh, it was quite, quite a strong model. Um, lots of people have asked me over the years, and I know you've gotten this question, so why do you use 3D technologies for ceramics? And there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of reasons. One, the files are easily reproduced, altered, and resized. So the original scan was a small, basically a squash. I do a lot of my investigating in nature and at supermarkets. And uh, you can stretch them, make them larger, make them smaller, et cetera. And it's in, in a very easy manner rather than reinventing it every time. Um, the, they are easily transported. So I could take the files on a jump drive. I could Dropbox them. I could send them digitally uh, anywhere to be printed. Um, there's a great deal of speed and flexibility not found in hand modeling. And then these virtual models, I can see them ahead. I could look at every angle of them before I actually print them and make a commitment about what I want. And um, so that's really an advantage that I think multiple perspectives on screen. And then I can also produce very durable models. I have reused these models. I've taken them to different countries. And they, um, they hold up really well. So currently, I've been col collaborating with Thomas Story, and he is also an art and tech MFA student. He describes, <coughs> excuse me, too much talking, describes the scanning process as 3D photogrammetry, which you have mentioned. He's actually using it as an art form as well and does videos with some of this. And you can see how the images, oops, that jumped. Uh, images um, are revolving around a scanning, um, an artichoke in this particular case. So multiple photographs taken from various angles and positions. And there's a coordinate system that generates a mesh, um, which is what eventually the computer reads to print. Um, so there are a number of ways to scan images, and this is really a wonderful way to get students started in this because they don't have to be intimidated about having to learn how to use some sort of digital uh, modeling software. Uh, you can do the free freeware like 123D Catch with your phone or your iPad. Um, there's now a, 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 a structure scanner that attaches to an iPod so you could travel around with it and scan. Um, and then, um, my preference has been a Next Engine 3D scanner, which I'll show you in the next slide, because it has a very user-friendly software, exports files and various files and can, that can be used for 3D printing. This photogrammetric process requires common points of contrast between the images to re reconstruct the space. Um, the uploading process takes all these 2D images and processes them into a 3D file that can take some time. Um, but in the end, you get a, uh, typically get a high quality image that can be used to then print. Um, so the detail is absolutely amazing. I mean, it, that's an example up there. And, and this is not an easy object to scan because of a lot of undercuts. Um, but you can just certainly get some very, very detailed scans. Here is the uh, next engine. Um, I had used a Z-Core handheld scanner. That's about a $30,000 scanner that we have in our lab. This is about a $3,000 scanner, uh, just to give you an idea. And, this, and then, of course, there's freeware, as I mentioned, as well. What I like about this particular scanner is that it comes with its own turntable, so you can keep something in its spot. It moves it around for you instead of you moving around. Um, so, and we seem to, for some reason, we're skipping here a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, so that has some... Um, definite advantages to it. A little bit about my work. When I travel and explore the world, I can't help but make connections. Nature is one place that I look for these connections. Interestingly, the word nature 
has multiple definitions, ranging from a person's inherent character to an organ's function and to the flora and fauna found in the landscape. I'm sorry, it's doing its own thing. I, my hand wasn't even on it. I apologize. I scan natural objects and make models to cast in plaster for slip casting in porcelain. At this stage, I make the connection of the model to the clay object. And despite this use of technology and people thinking that I don't use my hands anymore, I do a, a tremendous amount of handwork, cleaning, connecting, glazing, and finally using decals and china paints. Uh, so this is my Piante series that involves building in assemblage fashion to create this arrangement. In these pieces, I use LED lit pedestals to accentuate the translucent qualities of the porcelain and cast glass, adding the elements of light and shadow to the composition. And by taking natural objects and using them in a digital form, back again, um, they suggest a relationship between the forms that takes on a genre of the still life. On this particular piece you can see in person at the Lady Volkis Gallery and the Honors and Fellows Show. And uh, my recent research has actually begun to explore printing with ceramic materials directly, and I've had the privilege of working with the Tethon people on this. Um, I continue to explore 3D technologies and how I might use them in my work and have been increasingly interested in the digital mark making. Uh, for a long time I've been smoothing that stuff out, but now I'm really getting um, interested in it and so that, um, so that I've uh, continued to do this. So this, this particular piece printed by Tethon with their powder-based material is in the Airstream show. Now, uh, I'm always looking for collaborations. Our, our department itself doesn't have a lot of money, but I find that there's money out there, as, as Soji suggested. So I create, um, uh, when I, I, I applied for an internal grant, it's called a Catalyst Grant, and the purpose is for people to actually, across campus, work together. And so I am uh, working with a colleague in materials engineering uh, that I had had some previous contact with before. Our proposal involves the notion of improving ceramic 3D printing materials because uh, they've come a long way even within the year that we've been working, um, but not quite to the point where um, we, we were uh, satisfied. Um, additive manufacturing by way of 3D printing is still relatively new in comparison to many other um, ways of, 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 of manufacturing. And so part of what we're trying to do is improve those ceramic materials, not just for the artists, but obviously with working with the engineer for industry. And so we kind of um, are working together for that same goal. Um, we as ceramic artists have a wealth of empirical knowledge on how to use the materials to achieve particular aesthetic appearance. And then the materials engineers have specific, or some say, excuse me, scientific knowledge and understanding why the materials behave and appear the way they do. And so this is complementary expertise. Um, they, they're sending people to learn how to do glaze tests at our studio, and we're sending people to, look, to work with some of their equipments as well. And with that grant, I was able to fund this symposium. You see a poster of um, building steam, and uh, it involved people 3D printing at UF across the disciplines for the purpose of, uh, purpose of future collaboration. And as many of you know, um, STEM, as, as uh, uh, Soji already talked to us, is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're constantly at our university trying to add that A. Um, and with the idea that it contributes creative and critical thinking into the mix. And so this was a hands-on um, symposium that um, had a particular focus on UF uh, activities in the field. The presenters came from materials engineering, that one of the people printing soft tissue in hand sanitizing gel to hold the soft tissue up, a neurosurgeon using 3D printing for accuracy and simulations for surgery, a librarian working with a paleontologist to print specimens for the Science Museum, and Kate Dunn, who's an artist, ceramic artist from Sydney, Australia, and her work deals with robots and sustainable materials. Dwayne Bray, who's vice president of IDEO, you've probably seen them on 60 Minutes and in many articles, and. The Tim Brown's book, um, he facilitated the brainstorming and collaboration aspects of the event. The proceedings were are live streamed on YouTube and the results compiled and I've received funding from the Office of Research to have a website, which stay tuned. Um, I will be sure with, to publicize with this group. Uh, we'll put the proceedings on that as well as we're working on a match.com interface so that people that want to collaborate in the future can connect with other people that want to work in 3D um, technologies across, uh, across the campus and beyond. 
I mentioned the library's uh, presentation, and the, uh, the event was actually at our high-tech room and area in the Marston Science Library. And this library has a large and busy print-on-demand lab. This is a library. Uh, and these are all reasonably priced, mostly just for materials that students might have to pay for. And um, um, er almost every branch, including our art and architecture library, have, uh, have those uh, new next engine scanners. You can sign out a structure, 3D scanner, to attach to your iPad. You can sign out iPads which mo with modeling software on them. Uh, and pretty soon, they're going to have some very small and portable 3D printers that you can sign out and take home and print. So I think that, that this is a huge trend right now uh, for libraries across the country. And not just libraries at universities, I'm finding as well. Uh, and here's a snapshot of our fab, fab lab, the original lab. Uh, and as I mentioned, the water jet cutter is now housed there. We're able to cut uh, things like PC substrate, other uh, ceramic materials. So that's been very exciting. And it's moved to a dormitory. It's in an innovation dormitory on the first floor. Um, this is that whole idea of the thematic dorm type thing, and they have uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship has a space there, et cetera. So it's all, it's basically an incubator dorm. Um, and then Eddie's here, so you can pick his brain. His poster's hanging on there, so I'm just going to briefly introduce that, and I hope you'll go over and see what we're doing um, in terms of the students. Uh, one of the ways to incorporate this technology into the classroom is we have a university scholar program. And uh, he is, is a university scholar that I am mentoring. And in his, uh, what he has been doing is using 3D scanning and printing. And he's printing the mold for the mold. And um, I'm, I won't take the time because I really would like you to talk to Eddie about this, but you can see here the basic process. He's scanning a toy car with uh, usually the next engine scanner uh, and then uh, making intricate designs in Maya and then working on making a, a mold of that and then a mold for that particular mold. And so he's received funding to do this research and travel and pay for some of his printing costs, as well as I as his mentor. So I'm trying to talk a little bit about how you might think about uh, ways to connect and be able to do some of these things, because very often that's a stumbling block. How do, I, how do I get the funding to be able to do this sort of thing? Um, these images illustrate what I consider a gentle approach to basic 3D scanning. Um, I asked, had my advanced students um, use some uh, scan do a scan on the 3D, um, the next engine scanner of an, of an object that they found, um, do a little bit of work with the modeling software. We use primarily a uh, mesh mixer, which is free and downloadable to prepare the, um, the scans. They had to sit and watch it print on a little solid doodle printer I have in my office, because very often you just send a file even at the library, and you never really see how it actually builds. And then they took that, made a mold, and then they had to do uh, uh, a number of these pieces. It, it's, a, it's a prototype and repetition thing. I use Japanese methods of collection after they've produced those objects, and these are some of their results. And one of my students said, but I'm a potter, when I was forcing him to do that. But sure enough, he soon enough got involved in it. Uh, so it's, a, it's sometimes a little bit even to convince a young student that this is something that they should be working on. Um, I mentioned that the Fab Lab, uh, that we have this Fab Lab. There's actually a class that's taught by um, usually an art and tech and sometimes a ceramics person. And that covers laser cutting. Um, we can do things like making an extruder die. You'll see an example up there, CNC routing. Um, to, um, to also print uh, molds. Uh, you can print in foam, make a mold uh, out of plaster, and then pour, uh, uh, pour a press mold from there. And then most recently with the water jet cutting, and you'll see um, Karen Sankis' work here. She's cut PC substrate and then did decals on that. And we have um, an example of Bridget Fairbanks' work here where she's used, um, used the, uh, this technology to actually make extruder dies. And speaking of curriculum, uh, I hope we have, can have a little bit of conversation regarding this. You know, we know all the things we have to teach students before they graduate from a ceramics program on the left. And now on the right, there's a whole new group of things. Our students need to learn how to co collaborate. Creative thinking, design thinking, they'll be lost if they can't, can't work with other people. We try to work 
put them together with engineers and entrepreneurs all the time. And then, of course, all these technologies. And the dilemma here is how do we keep doing what we do on the left side and still be able to incorporate what's on the right side and still get them to graduate in four years so that our universities are happy. And I'd love for some of that conversation to happen afterwards. Um, my Catalyst grant also supported the purchase of a Delta Wasp. Um, the Wasp company is Italian. Uh, and even though I could speak Italian, we still had problems with the extruder head that they sent us. Um, but the machine itself was quite exciting. And we're working with engineering students. So actually, this machine right now through my grant is in the engineering department and will eventually move to, uh, to the ceramics program. And this is just an early test. We're working on different pastes. And with our engineering um, people, we'll be kind of substituting pastes once we're happy with what we have. As for my teaching, I plan to continue to introduce these technologies in my classes as a tool, just like a wheel, just like a slab roller. Um, in uh, Stephen Hoskins' book on 3D printing for um, the artists, um, the real, he says, um, the real test comes when the objects transcend the process involved. Currently feels are subservient to the process. Hard to argue. There are some people, obviously, uh, moving beyond that, like Michael Eden and Jonathan Keep, and uh, hopefully it'll continue in that path. So I want to thank you very much and look forward to our conversation. So we have some time to take a few questions. So Um, the contrast between a 100% computer-generated image compared to work that is totally 100% handmade, and how to reconcile those two processes if they're looked at with the same criteria um, as in a show. I called Soji about this because we, in K-12, I had a decision to make uh, on a separate category or because mm. some students feel intimidated that they can't do a perfect piece like a printer can. So uh, please address um, this creative issue that we have, this dilemma. Do you want me to go for it? Yes. Yeah, sure. um, well, one thing um, I want everybody to think about is that uh, even if you say you're doing something that's hand built, most likely you've, you, you know, it's very likely that you used a wheel, a, a rolling pin, a slab roller, uh, um, an extruder of some kind. So in reality, all, almost everything we do involves some kind of other tool. And so I try to, that, that I've given many talks about another tool in the toolbox or a new tool in the toolbox is how my engineering colleague likes to look at it. And so I try to demystify it a bit. Um, almost everything, even as it comes out of the uh, machine, involves some sort of cleanup, glaze. Um, and then there's lots of people that are just using it to do like a basic shape. I think Holly, at, uh, Holly Hanishan at FSU, a lot of what she does is take the wet piece and then manipulate it. So, so there's ways to do, to do some of that. So um, it, it, it still involves the hand but it's not the same. And, and I think we, we're trying to get it to fit into that, and that it, that's just, it's, it, it probably shouldn't fit into that. I think we have to have a new paradigm and try to talk about it more like it being a, just another way to make something. And um, I try to, uh, some people are intimidated, and I'm just saying you, you don't have to use this. Like, you really don't have to use this. So uh, the idea, I think, is to just make it be one of those other ways of building. And it's so I so I, I don't have a magic bullet for your answer. I think we're still very much uh, trying to figure that one out. Um, and I think it's going to get easier as we go because people are using it a lot more as just another tool. Right. And that's what we had kind of talked about on the phone. And it's like, you know, at this point, it seems that the vocabulary keeps expanding. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, it's kind of like the intellectual property issues when all the dot coms were going on, and they were, you know, those laws and rules were being written far after the advancement of technology. And so, I think eventually it's going to catch up 
and so we're going to be able to have more of a, I think, more discussions that are grounded in the the, pra the studio practice. And so I think you know I think there'll become a time when we start to think about this as basically as another tool, but it's another component of ceramics. I, so. I use the jewelry people as an example. Yeah. They can print now with metals. I mean, Shapeways mm -hmm. will print gold. Mm -hmm. So, and they don't, we're, we're still, I mean, we're printing in clay, but there's still not quite a, a totally finished product when it comes out. Um, but they're, 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 it's it, that's it. And so they're, they're ahead of us in many ways, I think. And I kind of look to them to, to mm -hmm. see how some of that works. Um, but just that <clears throat> you, had, you had begun to talk about that. This was called reverse engineering at first. It was to copy things, industrial secrets, and how to make something else. And then it became rapid prototyping, because basically all they made then was some sort of prototype before they made the actual object. But in the industry now, it's additive manufacturing. And when you think about it, when we work in clay, we're doing additive manufacturing. And the irony of some of this, I find, is most of these machines build with coils. And how long have they been around? So I try to. That's, that's how I try to argue it. I try to make that connection. You know, th thousands of years ago, people were working in coils. Well, here we are, working in coils. I had a, com had a conversation with a couple of my students, and one of the conversations was, <laughs> if a piece gets broken, if, if it's made from the 3D printer, she can just print out another piece. But if uh, it was hand-built, it's gone or she makes another one that's similar to it, but right. it's always going to be different. Mm -hmm. So that's another. You scan the broken pieces. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I guess there's could. a way around everything. Right. <laughs> I want to yeah. say something about the last thing you said. You quoted someone else. Uh, uh, Stephen Hoskins. Uh, Stephen Hoskins. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that again? Stephen Hoskins. He runs, he runs the Center for Fine Print Research in Bristol, England. And he's, uh, he's written lots of articles. He actually, I think, was here last year presenting, yeah. if I'm not yeah, mistaken. I thought so. Yeah, I um, I think concept is what behind, what's behind your ability to judge a, a piece at a show. And um, Chris Gustin did those pieces of the voice. Uh, he, some friend of his was an opera singer, and she sang into his vessels at a show. And he thought that was beautiful, and they had recorded it, and they took a an Im, they took an image on a, on a chart of her voice, in uh, like a, a gr like a scale, or a a, 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 char a flow chart or something, and they took that those recorded and dig digitized the recording, and that's how they made the coils on those pieces that he made those little cups, was an exact replica of her voice modulation uh, in the cup, and they looked ancient. But I thought the concept uh -huh. was so important and it enlightened for me that when you judge an art show and there, a lot of pieces are hand built or built in the traditional sense and now they're being built in the, in, uh, you know, using these technologies, uh, I think it's the concept, don't you, that, uh -huh. that, is driv that drives a piece and rises it above its process? You would hope so, but you know, we're so, it's the technology right now that it's right. really slow. The concepts are slow moving. Yeah. You know, it's, it's gonna take some time for the concept to yeah. catch up with the technique. I totally agree. You know, the, it's been really kind of rooted in that technology and then really learning about like technique. Then I think once we start to master those ideas, then that con the concepts will become more mature. Mm -hmm. Then we'll then have eventually better designed ideas and then I think they'll all be all encompassing. But that quote's great because, you know, it's, there's a quote, there's a, you know, in Philip Rawson's ceramics, which is out way before any of this stuff was going on, he talks about the ideas that if it's a good pot or it's a good piece of ceramics, that it'll, it'll go beyond the tyranny of that technology, right? Mm -hmm. And so you'll see it for what it is and the, the true value of that beautiful object. So. And, and really, we all, uh, excuse me, I just wanted to say one yeah, more no, thing. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, the, tool, the toolbox, we, we teach the beginning students uh, all these skills, these hand skills, and these, and then we begin to teach them concepts, and then they become inspired by the processes that they are, are aware of. So we need to add this to the awareness of that. And in, in Texas, and it's a leader in education uh, trends and paradigms, uh, Texas isn't funding humanities like they used to. And Nobody they've taken is. them, out, and they took they took them out of the core, you know. Right. And I uh, was interested in this in order to make sure that ceramics stayed right. in the core. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. I think to 
Tom, Tom, Tom had his hand up. I saw mm -hmm. it. Get that. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> technology has pretty much gone past me. Um, and yet, I recognize that the younger generation is certainly far ahead in that world. And uh, I commend you for opening the door to the ceramic world uh, uh, for uh, the, the technological approach, which is still, to me, um, involving uh, the creative element. And that, to me, is uh, the most important. It doesn't make any difference what tool you use. Uh, it's how creative you can be with it. And I think uh, younger people will find what you're presenting um, another uh, direction that might fit who they are uh, as a would-be artist. I think this young lad sitting here probably knows more about the computer than I do. <laughs> but um, That's cute. Uh, I'm glad he's here listening anyway. But uh, thank you, Anna. I appreciate oh. what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. We have time? Still have time? For yeah, one more there? question. Dennis? Well, <clears throat> a lot of the work, and especially two or three years ago, or it, it, look, it still looks kind of mechanical. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do you think the aesthetics are coming along? Now the, the work that's being done now looks a little better. How do you, what do you think the curve's gonna be? What do you think about that? I think it's limitless, right? The potential is there and it's just, it's incumbent upon all of us or people that are excited or the younger generation that really are really interested in this to really kind of push it forward. And I'm a, you know, I'm a facilitator. I'm a, co mm -hmm. a conduit to a lot of this information. I'm the guy that can help get the money and get the equipment into my schools and try to offer the programs, and I'm still trying to figure out how it works in my own work. But I hire someone to help me with a lot yeah. of the Yeah, I mean, we have stuff. a research fellow that yeah. you know, really is dedicated mm -hmm. to doing this. And so yeah, I mean, but it is, you know, then that's, that's where we need your help. We need your feedback, and mm -hmm. this is a three-year project, and so we want to make the next one in Portland even better, you know, following, and then the subsequently the one after that. And so, you know, if you guys have recommendation, you know of artists that we don't know about, or, you know, like, or things Our that are interesting. Our student that's doing wonderful yeah, things. We'd exactly. love to know what they're doing. And that's where I think we can all dynamically engage each other. And, and so, and then if you, you know, if you buy into this, that, you know, it's like, it has the potential, I think, to be really limitless. So right now, we all admit that it's kind of in its infancy still, in some ways. And so, but I think it's getting better and better and better. So. Thank you all for being yeah. here. This is wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. Stay, look around. Be sure to see yeah. Eddie over there. Right, we're gonna take we're gonna take a few minute recess to get the demonstrator set up, and then uh, we'll get to them by.